Glad you can join me for today's programming. And we've got a little bit different first half of the program. It may sound strange to you when I say that a giant is coming. I'm talking about a 10-story high, 112-foot statue that can impersonate anyone and that will be electronically connected to other like statues around the world. The statue is going to visit many cities in the world, and it's going to be on display. It's being celebrated and heralded even before it makes its global tour. Some pre-announced cities, this isn't all of them, but some include Berlin, Belfast, Dubai, Las Vegas, London, Phoenix, New York, Singapore. Many more will be added. This statue is going to be able to impersonate anyone. I'm going to repeat that. It will be able to impersonate anyone. Already, they are superimposing all sorts of people in their promotion. John F. Kennedy, Nelson Mandela, music and Hollywood stars, anyone. And the statue will then impersonate them and be the perfect image of that celebrity. Well, there's coming an idolatrous image of the Antichrist that will be different from any other idol in human history. And the false prophet will animate the image of the Antichrist so that it gives the appearance of being alive. I want to play a short clip here. Then I'm going to introduce my first guest of the program. It can also bring mega tourist dollars and support the local economy. On this side of the pond, a group of entrepreneurs are trying to fund an ambitious project to do just that. It's part statue, part business, part museum, part foundation, part gathering place, all somehow in one experience. I mean, it's gigantic and it's unusual and it's magnificent and it uses technology actually to celebrate humanity. It's a giant, more than 10 stories high, wrapped in an LED skin. It moves its head and its arms too. The designers say it's all about human potential and a greener future. The world has to change, and the giant wants to be part of this change and inspire people to reach their full potential and help save this planet. Their goal put a colossal statue in 21 cities, each one highlighting the giants in their community. It's going to hook into the communities and it's going to offer something really positive and, and also something fun and also something inspiring. And no need to take a traditional selfie. The giant does it for you. And after the year we've all had, reconnecting locally and globally is exactly what we need. Now, I understand my radio audience, you can't see that statue that the little clip is based on. If you do watch the video version of our program, you will see this amazing statue. You can find that on my website, olivetreeviews.org. You can find that on YouTube, Rumble, his channel, Light Source. So I encourage you to, when you can, watch the video version because you'll see so much more. I want to bring on my guest right now. He is Pete Garcia. Pete is a retired military veteran, an aviator, writer, speaker. He's a teacher of Bible prophecy and apologetics, and this is how I got to know Pete. He began his writing career at Jack Kinsella's Omega Letter. Pete has a chapter in the Terry James book, Lawless, End Times, War Against the Spirit of Antichrist. He has since branched out to create his own website, rev310.net. That's rev310.net. He's written over 500 articles, have been posted various places. Pete, welcome to the program for the first time. Thank you, Janice. It's a pleasure to be here. Just going to read a quick Bible verse here, and then we want to get your perspective on things. I'm going to Revelation 13. Here's a couple of verses, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Revelation 13, 14, and 15. And I want to stress right up front here, Pete, that neither you nor I are saying that this giant is necessarily the image of the beast. But nonetheless, you've seen the videos, etc. I've seen them. Pretty creepy, and it could come about, right? 
Absolutely. I think that this speaks a lot to observation and potential versus what we would consider speculation. And we are observing these things happening in our world today. And we're putting a spiritual eye to it and looking at these things through the lens of the Bible. And the Bible said that verse 2,000 years ago was written by John right. on the Patmos. For millennia, theologians and teachers have wrestled with this idea of how can a statue come to life? Right. If you look at the world today, there's around 150 giant statues. These are statues that are about 98 feet and higher, the tallest being over 700 feet, and the smallest being around 98 feet. But those statues are built out of what we would consider traditional materials, stone and metals. Some have some wood and bamboo and things, but for the most part, they're fixed into whatever icon they're created as. Whether they're created as a Buddha or Muhammad or Jesus, they're going to stay that way until eventually they fall apart or destroyed. What's unique about these giant statues that are coming is very reflective of the narcissistic age we live in with the ultimate selfie, the ecumenicalism of it, that these statues aren't fixed to one icon. It can be whoever you want it to be, whatever country or region of the world that you're in. That's who that icon can reflect and can change on the hour every day. Right. It can morph into different people. They can sing. They can speak. Your normal statue is pretty permanent. It doesn't get animated, your average statue. This one does. This one talks. This one moves its arms. This one bends its head. This is more than a statue. This is a creepy thing that could easily morph into the image of the Antichrist. And as Mark Hitchcock opened with that clip that I played, there are over a hundred passages in the Bible that talk about the Antichrist. There are many, many passages, and I'll try to refer to some here, that speak of the image of the beast. Ultimately, we know it's going to all be defeated by God, but in the meantime, we just see prophecy being fulfilled on a daily basis. You're right, and there's eight passages in Revelation that put the beast and the image together, and that it's not just the worshiping of the Antichrist himself, but also of this image. So this image is going to play a significant role in the Antichrist administration and this final world government to come. This statue is billed as the tallest moving structure. It's billed as a place to behold heroes because it can morph into anybody you can imagine. It's billed as a place to celebrate those who are great. It's supposedly coming to 21 cities in 2021 and beyond. So it's created, I believe, in 2015, but it's just getting into gear in 2021. The Bible does not provide many details concerning the image of the beast. We know this, however, that the false prophet will have the power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak, Revelation 13, 15. This breathing, speaking image of the beast will then demand worship. Anyone who refuses to worship the image of the beast will be killed. And then Revelation 20 verse 4 says that the mode of execution, as we know in the Bible, is going to be beheading. Did you ever think you'd see something like this in your lifetime? When you sit and watch that video, which again, we'll show in the video version of our program here. Pete, it's just stunning. It is. Honestly, I didn't know about it until this year. And as you mentioned earlier, this thing has been going on since about 2015. So this idea has been in the minds of these entrepreneurs and these folks that want to make this happen. What's interesting with regards to the false prophet being able to breathe life or make this image come to life is in part of their promo, they said the giant will lead the charge on promoting sustainable living, climate action, and funding programs, as well as engaging in other philanthropic endeavors. While every giant is bespoke for its city and country, each is also a member of a family that can digitally communicate with other giants around the world. And then if you go down later into the things that this can do, they talk about highly immersive exhibits feature state-of-the-art technologies, including augmented and virtual reality, robotics, and artificial intelligence. And they're going to build these statues as global events will engender global communities, and these will be trend-setting events that will become a defining social feature for the coming decades. So it's not just the statue itself, but the base of the statue becomes these huge exhibits, and these big areas for yes. events to happen. And if you overlay that with Revelation 13, you could picture a guillotine there. You can picture yeah. a lot of things that could be happening down the road with this if put into the wrong hands. Well, the city of Phoenix, it can't wait for this to happen. A giant 10-story tall statue in downtown Phoenix. An Irish company wants to make it a reality. The company has plans to build these giant statues in 21 cities in 2021, and Phoenix is one of them. Team Charles' Mitch Carr looked into the giant 
and how it would compare to the rest of the city's already vibrant art scene. People of the world, welcome to The Giant. The Giant Company builds the giant statue as the world's largest moving sculpture, capable of displaying the faces of famous Americans or even you. After a 360 degree body scan, imagine you can be the giant. It seems like something out of a science fiction movie. And if you look around town at Phoenix's hundreds of murals and other art installations, it would certainly be unique. I think it's really cool and it should go everywhere. If I was traveling somewhere, like travelers coming into Phoenix, I would probably want to see that. The actual public art program um, that is produced and conducted by the city of Phoenix is actually nationally, if not internationally, renowned. Katrina Kaler is the president and CEO of ArtLink, which works to produce and display public art in Phoenix. ArtLink works with the city, property owners, and artists to get the right pieces of art in the right places. Kaler is not involved with, nor has she seen plans for, the giant, but says any art piece needs to fit in. The most successful art installations are relevant to the community and relevant to the place. The Arizona Republic reported that Phoenix was one of 21 cities targeted by the giant company. Coming to 21 cities in 2021. The giant company did not respond to our request for comment, but the city of Phoenix's planning and development department said it had received no official inquiry on permitting or site review from the company. Awaken the giant in you. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I'm talking about a phenomenon that began in 2015, but in 2021, the giant is supposed to visit 21 cities. That was some media out of Phoenix because they're all excited about it. I'm talking about it with Pete Garcia, and you may know Pete from a lot of online writing. He's got some books out as well. He began his writing career with the Omega Letter, Jack Kinsella's organization from 2011 to 2018. And Pete has a chapter in the Terry James book we carry, Lawless, End Times, War Against the Spirit of Antichrist. Find it in my online store, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. His own website now is rev310.net. So Revelation 3.10 says, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. What's coming on the whole world is the tribulation. And the Lord is saying to the church, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. Pete Garcia, before I move on further, tell me why you have your website titled rev310.net. I know, but I suspect my audience might need to be clued in here. I think it's one of the strongest evidences for the pre-tribulation rapture, and the fact that the Lord promises to keep us from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world. It's not just keeping us through it, it's keeping us from the very time of it that's coming upon the inhabitants of the earth. If we weren't in heaven, why would Jesus need to distinguish between right. the inhabitants of the earth, between anybody else? If we weren't in heaven, where else would we be? So I think that's one of the strongest evidence for the pre-trib rapture, and that's why I fell in love with the name, and I never want to change it. You can find more at rev310.net. Going back to this image of the beast, so whatever it is, the image of the beast is the focal point of worship in the religion of the beast during the second half of the tribulation, paying homage to the image of the beast is how the deceived people of the world will worship this man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, Second Thessalonians 2, 3, who sets himself up as a god in the temple of Jerusalem. And those who do not worship the image of the beast will suffer the wrath of the Antichrist. But those who do worship the image of the beast will suffer the wrath of God, which is far worse. We're not saying that this traveling giant is going to be the image of the beast, but again, it moves, it morphs into whoever you want it to be. Whoever people want to idolize and make a shrine out of, it can morph into that person. They show it in the videos, morphing into John F. Kennedy, many, many others, Nelson Mandela. Whoever the world wants to celebrate, how about if the world wants to celebrate the Antichrist? 
and therefore the image of this beast is going to turn up just as we're outlining here. Pete, you sent me some takeaways here, and I think we should talk about them for a few minutes. And the first takeaway is the fact that these statues are programmable, as opposed, as you said, to a traditional stationary statue means they can be hijacked for nefarious purposes. And number two, the fact that these statues will be digitally linked together means they can broadcast messages around the world simultaneously. And when the world moves under one government, this digital linkage will come in handy. I think that's really important to understand, Pete, and that is that this is possibly a piece here in the puzzle of the one world system. Absolutely. Those two things are key for today for me. And I've listened to a lot of people speak about the giant, and they've talked about linkages to the Bible. What distinguished these particular statues from any other time in history and that the fact that they are programmable, but that programming can be hijacked, can be hacked, and they can be used for nefarious purposes. We know that demon possession can happen. How much easier is it for a demon to possess a non-living thing, a machine or a system? If you look back a couple of years with Google trying to mess around with AI, uh-huh. they have these two AI bots talking to each other. Next thing you know, they've created their own language, and next thing you know, they're talking about very scary things. Bill Gates, Elon Musk... A number of other folks are terrified by the thought of artificial intelligence and the potential, as Elon Musk said, unleashing these demons on the world. Here's just a few illustrations referring to this image of the beast. Again, Revelation 13, 14, and 15, most obvious. The false prophet deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that he is permitted to perform on behalf of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the sword, wound, and yet lived. And he was permitted to give a spirit to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause whoever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Again, Revelation 14, 9, a third of the angels followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink of the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength in the cup of his anger. Revelation 15, 2, I also saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had won the victory over the image, over the beast, his image, and the number of his name, were standing on the sea of glass with harps from God. Revelation 16, 2, the first bowl angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and severe painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. We could go on, but just trying to point out that there is much talk in the Bible about this image of the beast. Pete, let me quote from an article you've written, and let's talk about it for the next remaining few minutes. Just going to read two paragraphs from a very recent article of Pete Garcia, and you can find more at rev310.net, rev310.net. You write, One of the biggest takeaways I have noticed throughout the last two years regarding the global response to the severe acute respiratory syndrome, COVID-19, is not the innate desire by responsible governments to eradicate this man-made virus, but in the slavish demands of obedience it placed on their citizens. Stay home, shut your business down, social distance, wear a mask, Take the shot. Take both shots. Take both shots and wear the mask. Take both shots, wear a mask, and stay home. Get the vaccine passport. And then you continue. As previously mentioned, perhaps COVID-19 was created with the sole intention of not creating a new virus through illegal gain-of-function research, but for creating the global need for a vaccine passport. The premise behind this thinking is as follows. If you don't get a passport, you cannot travel to work. You cannot buy or sell. You cannot go to school. You basically surrender your right to a normal life. While this COVID-19 crisis is not the fourth seal of Revelation 6, I believe, and this is your personal opinion, that this enforcement of these untested injections may lead to a superbug scenario down the road that later plays out when the fourth horseman ride. Pete, you are saying that what has happened to the world in the last 18 months certainly could be apocalyptic. Others are saying this is but a blip on the radar and it's going to pass. I'm not so sure about that. And personally, I see tyranny rising in America and other parts of the West, and it really troubles me. 
I see the growing loss of freedom. Where do you see this going? I think the sense of normalcy that people want to go back to, it's never going to come back. With 2020, we crossed this threshold of government power where they want to take the world based off of the United Nations mandates, Agenda 2030 and all that. They've already seen that they can do it and they're not going to back off. Historically speaking, tyranny has never just tried a little bit and then we went too far, let's back off. It never happens. It always escalates more and more until some crescendo happens, and whether that's a war, civil war, or something. It always pushes that limit to maximize government tyranny, and that's why the Constitution was written to limit government power. There's more things in the Constitution to empower the individual than there is to empower the government, which is why we have the checks and balances. So we found out this last year how powerful governors really are. Before that, most people never really paid too much mind about who the governor was. But now they can shut your state economy down. Now it sinks in like, wow, that really matters. 2020, as bad as it was, is as good as it's going to get. Things are just going to continue to escalate Mm -hmm. from there. And it'll be in different areas. It won't just be with pandemics. It'll be the economy. It'll be the dollar failing. And all these other things are going to start piling on top of each other until we reach this point where a one world government is the only viable solution. That's right. And the experts will get on the soapboxes and they'll say, hey, we have to do this. This is the only way to go forward. I think that's where we're headed. Your conclusion, it's my conclusion too, and you write in your various articles, one I've cited here very recently in your conclusion, first of all, we must recognize that our time remaining is incredibly short. Things are being condensed and compacted to the point that this convergence has been coming at us like a flood. You say this should promote two reactions from us, and this is what I want to focus on for just a minute here. Two reactions. Number one, loosen our grip on the things of this world. And two, step up to become the watchman God has called us to be. I think, Pete Garcia, the thing I see too much of, and I understand, a lot of people have a lot to live for, but they are clinging to the things of this world because they enjoy the things of this world so very much. But In the last 18 months, the things of this world are beginning to crumble, and you just alluded to we're just beginning to see the things crumble. What's next? The whole financial system? Possibly. All sorts of things could still crumble. And number one, step up to become the watchman God has called us to be. Go for it here. Why don't you expand on your thoughts here? We just got to look at the world today and realize that none of what's happening now, whether we're talking about the government's response to covid the rapid implementation of the vaccine. Now there's talk about vaccine passports. Politicians are saying we need to make it difficult for people who are not vaccinated. All of this is by design. Mm -hmm. It's all engendered to get us to go to a one world system. The people that are pushing this, they're true believers in this and that they believe that this is the only real way to fix all the world's problems. And I like the quote that I borrowed from Pastor Ken Ortiz. I led off with my article on that. He says, shadows are interesting things. They communicate a reality yet They themselves are not really real. They indicate the thing that is coming, yet they are not the things themselves. What we're seeing today are the shadows of the things that will happen inside of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see them now. And if we're starting to see those things now, how much closer are we to the Lord's return at the rapture? For Christians, even though the times are bleak and you can't turn on the news without being blasted with terrifying information, we have to realize that there is the silver lining and that Christ is coming soon and that these things are pointing to that. We're not looking at these things today trying to be sensationalists. We're looking at these things as observers of the times. And just like if I were back in 1903 on the airfield there at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, watching the Wright brothers take off for the first time, I would look at this plane flying in the air and i think, wow, man has done it. Man has conquered air. We can now fly. But I would also look at it and say that has potential to be used by the military. It has the potential to be used for commercial purposes. So we look at these giants and we look at the signs of the way that government's reacting to all these crises, and we see those as those things can be potentially used for the wrong purposes, and I think that's where the world's headed at this point. Play one more clip of Mark Hitchcock here, and I'm going to come back and make a comment about it. The Bible talks about this coming world ruler, the Antichrist. It's interesting. He's called the little horn. So he arises first insignificantly. That's why when people always write me today and say, well, who do you think the Antichrist is? And, you know, they're trying to figure out the Antichrist. We don't know who he is today. He's going to rise insignificantly. If someone were significant on the scene today, that's not him because he's going to rise from insignificance. So um, this could be someone who is uh, a backroom bureaucrat, right? That's right. Not a clue. That's right. And my view is that I think Satan always has a man ready in every generation. I think there's always an Antichrist who's alive somewhere. That's interesting. That's an interesting thought. That is. 
Pete, I agree with Mark Hitchcock there. In every generation, Satan had someone that he had tapped on the shoulder who could emerge as an antichrist, and he's got someone tapped in our current generation. We don't know who that is, and the purpose of this hour is not to try to figure him out today, but each generation, someone, Satan says, you be ready to go when I give you the signal. There's probably more than one. If you look back to World War II, yeah. World War One, and the time period there, you had four folks. Really That's right. Installed. You did. Hitler, mm-hmm. Mussolini, FDR. Anytime you give man power, it's a very addicting drug to have, is to have power over other people. And Satan can use that to anybody that's not redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He can turn their hearts. And we don't know who this guy is yet, but we know he's coming. And the Bible says that when he comes, he's also going to have this image with him. And this image is going to be part and parcel with his administration and how he rules over the world and demands worship from everywhere, and how he can demand worship from everybody everywhere and only be in one place at a time. So the economy, having this economic system of the mark of the beast to control all buying and selling, we can see shadows of that now with this talk of the vaccine passport where you can't buy or sell, you can't travel, you can't leave your house, you can't leave your country unless you have this thing. These are shadows of things to come, and we're seeing them now in our day, and that should cause us to want to have a seriousness in our walk with the Lord. Amen. To get serious about getting busy about the Lord's work. Luke twenty one twenty eight. when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. Pete Garcia, thank you for joining Understanding the Times Radio today. Again, you can learn more at rev310.net. And we'll talk again, Pete. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Back in a couple of minutes. Don't go away. It's right around the corner now, so why not get it on your calendar? and plan to live stream this timely event. Behold He Comes is the West Coast Prophecy Conference on September 11th at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, California, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Pacific Time. All seats are taken, but you can stream the event live or on demand anytime for just $5. Here is Pastor Jack Hibbs. Hi, I'm Pastor Jack Hibbs, and I want to encourage you, Pastor, to join us for a live stream event on September 11th, that's a Saturday, 2021, where we are going to be hosting a very special Bible prophecy conference titled, Behold, He Comes. My goodness, around the world, there are so many things going on that herald the coming of Jesus. So we're going to get together, and I'm going to be joined with special guest speakers, Amir Serfate and Jan Markell and Barry Stagner, as we spend Saturday, September 11th, streaming live various teachings concerning what does the Bible say about our days. We believe it's going to be a great opportunity for you to gather your church together and have a tremendous time of being in the Word. We'd love to have you join us. It'd be very exciting. So listen, to find out more, please go to BeholdHeComes.org. BeholdHeComes.org. And we hope to see you online. Say, I recently did an interview with Tim Moore, who is the new head of Lamb Lion Ministry, founded 40 years ago by Dr. David Reagan, and the program aired on their television program, Christ in Prophecy, just a few weeks ago. Tim and I discussed the turmoil of our times in the world and the church. I hope you enjoy this short interview. It's posted to my website under video and also under radio, then to complete archives if you'd like to see it again. A number of prophetic voices have proclaimed truth to our culture, but one is unique. As both a woman and a Christian with a Jewish heritage, Jan Markell represents a modern-day watchman or watchwoman. Jan began following Yeshua when she was 11 years old. As a young woman, she traveled to Israel, studied Bible prophecy, and served with Jews for Jesus. In 1982, Jan launched Olive Tree Ministries to help people understand the times according to the Bible, contend for the faith in Jesus Christ, and help the church stand against deception as watchmen on the wall in these last days. I can't think of a more significant or timely calling. Today we'll hear from this giant in the Bible prophecy realm who the Lord has disguised as a wonderfully petite woman. Jan, thank you very much for welcoming me and for being a part of this broadcast of Christ in Prophecy. Welcome to Minneapolis. So glad you can be here. 
Well, thank you very much. Obviously, we are here at not only her hometown, but actually her home and the headquarters of Olive Tree Ministries. And it is a beautiful day in Minneapolis. It was a little foggy this morning, but the fog has cleared. And that's kind of symbolic that the fog is clearing, even as we are able to understand more and more Bible prophecy. That's very, very well put. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I know that the Lord has given you insight, Jan. So what has He laid on your heart that you've been sharing through Olive Tree Ministries these many years? Uh, Tim, I think that we are in the most profound times when it comes to the topics that we cover on a daily basis, the most profound, stunning times, perhaps with the least amount of interest in the church. And I think perhaps this last year that might have changed a little bit, mm. and that's because this last year has been so significant with incredible happenings around the world with what this pandemic has done to the world and the church and, and for setting the stage for global government, et cetera. I think now there's a little more interest in the church, but it's been um, tough to get the church to get really interested in, in these important issues. Well, I know that your ministry focuses on sharing truth from a biblical perspective and calling the church away from apostasy. But just to quote, uh, your purpose uh, here at Olive Tree Ministries is to help people understand the times according to the Bible, contend for the faith in Jesus Christ, I love that phrase, and help the church stand against deception as a watchman on the wall in these last days. And again, as a watchwoman, you have most assuredly fulfilled that mission statement. Well, I would like everyone to be watchmen on the wall, yes. every Christian. And I don't want them running away from our times. And I was just watching some clips this morning on YouTube, and there was the media talking about how people indeed are running away from reality because reality is getting scary. For the Christian, that shouldn't be the case. I no. mean, the Bible laid all of this out for us. Everything, there, there's not even any uncertainty for the believer. We know what's going to happen. We don't know the timing exactly. So it's exciting times. It certainly is. One of the things I was excited, even in studying in your ministry and doing some research, you named it Olive Tree Ministry. And I have to tell you, Miss Jan, that when I go to Israel, it's amazing to me to see the number of olive trees represented, not just literally with the trees that are growing naturally and having been planted, but it has become a symbol of modern Israel. It's like the, the stump that was cut down is springing forth new life. And even as we visit Yad Vashem on our pilgrimage groups, uh, the Holocaust Museum there in Israel, they have a pen that they sell, a lapel pen, that has an olive branch intertwined on a a uh, strand of barbed wire, symbolizing that out of the Holocaust of this last century, there is yet new life being sprung forth in the Jewish people, and the Lord is not done with them. He still has a purpose and a plan to bring a number of them. So, you are a living witness of God's goodness and His graciousness in bringing Jewish believers, Gentile believers into His church here in the United States and indeed even in Israel. Well, I think one thing you said that's uh, interesting that I'm just going to build on for a moment, and that is out of the terrible evil of the Holocaust, God used, God brought good out of it, mm. creating the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel came, be came because the Jewish people had been so persecuted that the world came together in uh, 1948 and said, yes, they should become a nation. The United Nations agreed because they'd seen the wreckage of the Holocaust. Right. And so God allowed that to happen. And the primary result was the rebirth of the nation of Israel in their own land. Growing up and as a young woman, did you ever see yourself becoming a prophetic voice to America or to the world as Dr. Reagan has declared? Uh, no, I didn't. And as a matter of fact, the first um, a couple decades of my ministry were very difficult. I had a very serious illness for the first couple decades I was in ministry, and it kind of held me back. Um, and I don't need to go into details, but uh, I just started radio in some 20 years ago because I kind of started late, a, a ministry in radio, uh, in 2000, 2001. So, um, but the first couple decades of ministry were a great struggle for me. So the fact that God has been able to use me in any way I find miraculous. And again, I'm just trying to wake people up as to the tide of our times. Mm. Because 
you know, it says in Ezekiel 33 that we're, we really are all called to be watchmen. Yes. And if we don't sound the alarm, whatever God has put on our heart and made us aware of, then the blood is on our hands. And so I'm just encouraging people, particularly as the hour now is so late, to speak up, to not hold back, to give forth the truth as they see it, as it concerns the lateness of the hour and, and winning the loss while there's still time, because mm. I don't know that we have a lot of time left. I love the, the point that you make. It's not just learning about what is going on, the events swirling around us, but really the motivation is to save a few, to save as many as are called. We're and on a rescue the mission. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we're not just yelling fire in a crowded theater. We're trying to give people a, uh, an understanding of the threat that exists and call them to the greater hope. Jane, you've actually coined a phrase that Dr. Reagan has used many times, and I've come to borrow. I, I give you credit for it, because even as our society and the world in general descends into chaos, yeah. you like to say, things aren't falling apart, they're falling in place. What do you mean by that? Well, I think as, and I've already referenced the tide of our times being tumultuous, and they are, and they're troubling. And if, if you look at headlines as often as I do, and I was looking at them early mm. this morning, and I had to look away because they were, they were troubling. But the Bible outlines everything that's to happen in detail. And so we're just watching things line up as the Bible said they would line up mm -hmm. in the last days. Unfortunately, the Bible says the last days will be perilous says that the last days will have mankind slipping into reprobate mind thinking. Yes. Uh, therefore, the last days are going to be troubling. And and yet they're falling into place just as outlined scripturally. And my question is, and we can get into this in our in our interview here, are the pulpits talking about these things? And if not, question. why not? And if there's still time... And we've just, we've had a year, 2020, an unbelievable year. And my hope is that pastors are, are building on what happened in this past year and that th there are lessons for the church in this past year. My goodness, uh, there are testings for the church in this past year. The church was closed much of 2020, yes. at least in certain states. They were fighting governors to, to even allow 10 people or 30 people in their building when they might have been a mega church, So right. there were tremendous challenges upon the church in the last year. But I'm hoping that's been a great opportunity for them too. I pray that it will be. Yeah. I think you're exactly right. Do we seize this opportunity? Yeah. Uh, listening to you, I'm reminded, as you say, it took a, a season for your ministry really to take off. But the Lord was preparing you for such a time as this, much like another lady of uh, Scripture, Miss Esther, who... Obviously, the Lord put in a particular place in a particular time so she could be a voice to save some of her people. And so on that note, I have to observe, Jan, that as a Jew, you've provided many times very poignant and heart-wrenching accounts of the anti-Semitism that has plagued the West in general and the church itself for 2,000 years. In your book and DVD chronicling Anita Dittman's testimony called Trapped in Hitler's Hell, you convict hearts that are, are receptive to truth and that are not satanically hardened. So tell us about your passion for the Jewish people in particular for, and for all people who need to hear this message of salvation. Well, I met, I met Anita Dittman in uh, 1978, wrote her book in 1979, and miraculously it's still circulating, which is incredible because books have a shelf life, quite frankly. Yes. They generally die after two years or so, and we just keep writing more books. But her story has lived on for over 40 years, mm. and I'm so grateful because referring to anti-Semitism and my burden on that topic, I mean, it's a huge topic. It's, it's taking off as we speak. It's taking off, my goodness, the whole Black Lives Matter movement is built around anti-Semitism. Yes. People don't know that. And churches are signing on to it, to the Black Lives Matter, and they don't realize that it's rooted in anti-Semitism. But my burden is more the anti-Semitism in the church, 
Now, you might say, you mean literal anti-Semitism? In some cases, yes. You've got the BDS movement, boycott, divest, sanction. You've got whole denominations. You've got the National Council of Churches mm -hmm. behind that, World Council of Churches. You've got certain denominations cheering the BDS movement on. To me, that's anti-Semitism in the church. Yes, You've got replacement theology in the church. And that's with the teaching that the church has replaced Israel and, and Israel is set aside so the church can be the prominent player of our time. Not, to, not so. But again, I see that as anti-Semitism. Now, is that particular church teaching that, are they blatantly anti-Semitic? Maybe not. But the theology they're embracing is, and, and they need to be called out on it. Too many times they are being deceived, and sometimes yes. e either through ignorance or occasionally through willful uh, agreement with deception. And so either way, I appreciate your voice calling them out. I've witnessed also a tremendous rise in anti-Semitism, and it's something that should be eradicated from the Church of Jesus Christ because it certainly does not reflect Christian values Well, and my beliefs. question is how can these people worship a Jewish Messiah and have anti-Semitic sentiment in their heart. I can't make that com no, That doesn't compute. Two and two doesn't make four. Well, you already referenced uh, the Lord giving over so many uh, people in this world to a reprobate mind. That's Romans 1. But in Romans 9 through 11, Paul also says, he has not cast aside the Jewish people and there are still promises held out to them. That's right. Jan, your prophetic voice is widely respected because you speak out truth even in our culture to any who are followers of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, obviously, in Hebrew. And yet you are also recognized as one of the few women who is fulfilling this role. You are, in that essence, a modern-day Deborah. And from that unique perspective, what kind of challenges and opportunities have you experienced as a leader here in Olive Tree Ministries? And Tim, I have had the distinct privilege of, for 40 years, filling a pulpit in every denomination imaginable, even in a Catholic church, giving the truth of the gospel, giving the truth of the issues we're talking about right now, seeing people come to faith in Jesus Christ for the first time. It has been, it has been, yeah, I could break down in tears just thinking about the times that I have had with wonderful people, some of them believers, some of them about to become believers mm. as a result of, of a message that might have been given. Uh, some of them not believers, but going home and thinking about eternity. Um, I remember one day in a denomination I will not name, you would not expect them to be, to be believers or to be enthused about this message, things we're sharing. As I left the parking lot, they were walking alongside my car asking questions. They were so hungry, hungry, hungry. for the truth. They would not, they did not want me to go. And it was a auditorium filled primarily of unsaved people. But they heard something that day that registered with them. And I don't think they'll ever be the same. And I've had the privilege of seeing that for all these years. And again, all the more is it is it more significant now in these last, not days, these last hours mm. that we keep this message alive. Yes, ma'am. Well, obviously over the years, the Lord has blessed your ability to reach people through new mediums. I know yes. one of your major outreaches is through radio, but you also have newsletters and of course an internet presence as well. Yes, and you have to today because today's generation is electronically connected and you've got to register with them or they'll be left behind. Well, one of the things I appreciate so much is our connectivity between our ministries, Lamb and Lion and Olive Tree, <clears throat> to make sure that we are mutually supportive and yes. sharing the same message. And as we talked earlier, even holding each other accountable. Well, I noticed even in reading your newsletters from the year 2020, a couple of uh, topics jumped out at me because they were so timely mm -hmm. given all the unrest of that year. Yeah. You talked about globalism's perfect storm and an article entitled, Everyone's Doing What Is Right in Their Own Foolish Eye. Oh, well, that's very timely. So what other lessons did 2020 teach us as we witnessed a rise of lawlessness even here at home in the United States? Well, and I'm glad we're talking about it, uh, Tim. We're in Minneapolis. I'm in ground zero for the past year. <clears throat> the turmoil that was sparked in 2020 started 20 minutes from my home in Minneapolis. 
<clears throat> when George, George Floyd was pinned down by a policeman. And <clears throat> that sparked uh, unrest in the country that mm -hmm. I frankly question will ever settle down. I mean that. It could be ongoing forever. Um, and, and that's the racial strife that was stirred right. up. But but I, I don't want to go down that path. What I want to, the path I want to go down <clears throat> is that um, th there is an agenda by the global <laughs> cabal, yes. the globalist system, and they needed a crisis. And they used 2020 as their crisis, be it the pandemic, be it the racial strife. They used all of that as the global crisis. Remember, it wasn't an American. <clears throat> it wasn't an American crisis. It wasn't a North American crisis. It was a global crisis. Yes. They used that crisis <clears throat> to help get their global government launched a little bit more. Obviously, it's not in play. The Antichrist has to be here, <clears throat> and the church has to be gone. So, but again, if we're in the last hours, that's exciting. It is exciting. I think one of the the lessons we talked about earlier is the way that those bent on globalism yeah. or on taking over in a dictatorial manner will use every opportunity. We used uh, the reference of Kristallnacht, the, yeah. the Nazi German night of glass where German thugs, Nazi thugs, went around breaking glass and persecuting Jews in particular. But then Adolf Hitler said, well, you see all this unrest. If you just put me in power, I can tamp down the unlawfulness that is taking place. Well, he was spurring it on. And today, many of those who are claiming to want to get power to quell the unrest are the ones that are fomenting it all along. That is true. Um, I am concerned about stoking the flames and literally, yeah, and we see that going on. And the church needs to come and be the, put out these fires. Um, but I'm seeing the church sign on to the racial unrest all in the name of social justice mm. and then signing on to the agenda of Black Lives Matter. It's a terrible mistake they're making um, because in the name of social justice, I mean, they're signing on to um, a, a movement that's very unhealthy, the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement. Well, obviously, Black Lives Matter and some of their manifestos as an organization, as an organization. are not only tremendously anti-Semitic, but they are pushing a very radical agenda of LGBTQ+, right. meaning that they are totally renouncing any Judeo-Christian values, even exactly. the family as a basic exactly. unit uh, that was God-ordained. So it is very problematic. But what do you see in some of the other trends, even from recent months and years, 2020 being a prime example, of demonstrating and foreshadowing the way that the Antichrist will rise to power. Do you see anything that we should be alarmed about? Yes, I think we should be alarmed when we see unmitigated lawlessness. And I don't know, I don't think we know where that's going. But we've seen in the last year, we've seen lawlessness take over our country. As a matter of fact, it took over parts of Australia and parts of Europe as well. Um, and anything that is lawless is not of God mm. and is obviously the rise of the Antichrist spirit. And I think, Tim, that's what I saw most in the year behind us. I think the thing I saw the strongest, the most impactful in a bad way, negative way, is the spirit of Antichrist raise its ugly head um, in the world and trying to influence the church. I, I, I don't know if it was successful, but they tried. Um, and again, is... The believer, are your listeners pushing back with the truth? And that's all we can do is give the truth, give the truth of the, what's happening in our world and give the truth of the gospel and get people on, in this rescue mission we have, yes. get them into the lifeboat, so to speak, of salvation. Well, I'm prayerful that over time, just as you said earlier, the Lord could take a great uh, horrific calamity like the Holocaust and make yeah. something good and beautiful come out of it that is the rebirth of Israel, which he foretold and prophesied would occur. And so even out of this darkness, we can see rays of light because as the world grows darker, the light shines all the right. brighter. And some people, I believe, are very hungry, just like the folks you shared a moment ago yeah. who are wanting to follow after you. We hear you have words of truth. Yeah. Share more of that with us. Yeah. 
yeah. So these are exciting times. I'm, I'm not. I'm not the least bit discouraged. I mean, again, I'm right here in Ground Zero, Minneapolis. Parts of it, huge segments were burned down last year and will never come back. And in the natural, that's very discouraging, but I'm, I'm not discouraged. I see it as a sign of the times. It's a, it's a reminder to the church, look up, I am coming soon. Amen and amen. Well, just like Deborah herself, uh, you've never been shy about proclaiming truth to power, whether it's people in the church or in the secular world, kings and rulers. And you've denounced the slide to the left in our society and, sadly, in so many of our churches. What do you see as the greatest threat to it, the church worldwide or here in America and the opportunity that they must seize, that we as believers must seize right now in such a time as this? Well, I think just discerning the, the times, how late we are. And again, um, is the church doing that? I, I don't think so. I think the, a deeper problem, Tim, is... Just the growing apostasy, which is pre predicted in the Bible. Yes. There are more re Bible references about the last days apostasy than almost anything else other than maybe the rebirth of Israel. Mm. And then you go out, Paul and, and Peter, all those verses in those First and Second Timothy, all the warnings about the wolves that are come, going to come and devour the flock with false teaching and horrible theology and doctrines of demons. And that's what's happening in our churches today. And again... Um, and there are there are watchmen, just good pew sitters who are watchmen trying to mm. warn, and in many cases they're they're brushed off, and nobody's listening to them, and they're trying to tell the church leadership, you know, we're going down the wrong path. We're just simply this church is going to, you know, whether it's New Apostolic Reformation or again replacement theology, all of these things that we could talk about if we had three hours and we'd fill them quickly. Um, so many things, and they've come along in the last hundred years. No, in the last really ten years. Yes. Even, even Christian Palestinianism. Whoever would have thought of that? No, oh, Jesus was a Palestinian. That's just in the last ten years or so. Yeah, the Palestinian, uh, I guess, ideology that has been sprouted forth in the last number of years. It is a lie in yeah. terms of trying to distract us from the truth revealed in Scripture. But it's distracted the church from a great calling, and yes, that is to get their folks fo focused on the on on winning the Jews to Jesus and to um, our our message on the end times that the King is coming. The King and, is coming, and Israel is the key. Amen, amen. Well, I appreciate what you said even about Ezekiel earlier. And being a watchman, a watchwoman, because the Lord said to Ezekiel, they will not listen to you, yeah. but I hold you responsible to declare the truth even though they won't or if they don't listen to you. And so, Ms. Jan, you have obviously been a watchman who has been faithful. And regardless of the, the great numbers of folks who are groping in darkness and whether or not they, they come to that light, you have been faithful in proclaiming it. Uh, I got to say this, in spite of all the gloom that we see descending on the world today, ours is a message of joyful yeah. hope. So tell us about your unfailing confidence in our blessed hope. Well, I have watched for um, the Lord Jesus to return. Quite frankly, I think I started watching as a young adult in the 1970s and went to Israel in the 70s, and, late 70s, and um, Hal Lindsey's book, Late Great Planet Earth, and that so inspired me. And I just want to encourage your listeners, we are not in dark times. I know the headlines appear that way, but we are a privileged generation to see all these things coming to pass. Whoever thought we'd be a part of the generation to see Israel become a nation, um, just to see so many things that are transpiring before our eyes on a daily basis, including the lawlessness, unfortunately. Mm. You've got to see the good and the bad. Yes, ma'am. And then try translate the bad into good news that the king is coming. And these are herald these are signs heralding his coming. I'm excited. I'm thrilled to be a part of this generation. It's been a, a tremendous experience and and uh, I've been privileged to work with you and Dave Reagan and Nathan and, and to have partners and partners in this kind of a ministry is needed because shots are coming at us every day. <laughs> yes, they are. Well, as Adrian Rogers was uh, want to say, it's getting gloriously dark. Yes. And you just hit the nail on the head. The King is indeed coming.
Jan Markell touched on the rise in anti-Semitism we're seeing around the world today. This is a particularly heinous sin for two reasons. Not only because scripture warns that anyone who abuses the Jewish people touches the apple of God's eye, but also because we know that God has not cast the Jewish people aside. His promise of blessing on the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob holds true because he is faithful. The biblical truth is that anyone who professes or aspires to have a Christ-like heart will have a supernatural love for the Jewish people, not a satanically inspired hatred toward them. And yet, for the past 1900 years, it has been self-proclaimed Christians and purportedly Christian nations that have persecuted Jews the most. That is why the marked rise in anti-Semitism throughout the West in recent years is so alarming. Whether overt harassment of Jews or an indoctrinated embrace of anti-Israeli boycott, divest, and sanction propaganda, or our current administration's appeasement of Islamist terrorists in Iran or Gaza and insistence on giving away the promised land for an elusive two-state solution, we are provoking God's righteous anger. No individual or nation can please God by disparaging and persecuting His chosen people. But that is exactly what Scripture says will happen in the end times, when every nation comes against Israel. What about you? Do you endeavor to bless the Jewish people and Israel? Have you prayed earnestly to God to lead you to one specific Jew that you can tell about Jesus Christ, our Jewish Messiah? Do you pray for the peace of Jerusalem as you look forward to the coronation of our Prince? Sagar